Whoa, hit the brakes. You've arrived at the number one drive-by for American history. Welcome to The Pit Stop. Brought to you by In the Pass Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. Here's Edward T. O'Donnell, your host and historian at large. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Pit Stop, your Monday source for history on the go in just about five minutes. We offer this mini feature every Monday in addition to our regular full feature episodes, like my upcoming conversation with historian Jill Lepore. Here's what happened in American history the week of June 24th, 2019. Let's start with birthdays. June 24th, 1813, that's the birthday of Henry Ward Beecher, who was born in Litchfield, Connecticut. Henry Ward Beecher was a member of a prominent abolitionist family. His sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Henry became one of the nation's most prominent ministers in the mid-19th century. His sermons and writings on the issues of the day were printed in newspapers all across the country. Before the Civil War, his harsh condemnation of slavery earned him both scorn and admiration. Abraham Lincoln, when he visited New York City in 1860 to deliver a notable speech at Cooper Union, attended services at Beecher's Church in Brooklyn. Henry Ward Beecher once declared, The most atrocious thing under the sun is the system of American slavery in a great free republic. Also born on June 24th, Ambrose Bierce, who was born June 24th, 1842, in Meigs County, Ohio. Ambrose Bierce was a journalist, a writer, and a poet. And these days, he's best remembered as the author of The Devil's Dictionary, a delightful collection of hundreds of words with snarky satirical definitions such as lawyer, noun, one skilled in the circumvention of the law, pray, verb, to ask the laws of the universe to be annulled on behalf of a single petitioner confessedly unworthy. And history, noun, an account, mostly false, of events, mostly unimportant, which are brought about by rulers, mostly knaves, and soldiers, mostly fools. June 24, 1895, boxer Jack Dempsey was born in Manassa, Colorado. Dempsey, nicknamed the Manassa Mahler, was one of the greatest boxers of all time. He was an iconic figure of the roaring 1920s and reigned as world heavyweight champion from 1919 to 1926. June 27, 1869, Emma Goldman was born in the town of Kovno in Lithuania, in what was then part of Russia. Goldman emigrated to the United States in 1885. It was a time of massive strikes and major social unrest, and Emma Goldman was quickly drawn into radicalism. She soon emerged as a strident advocate of anarchism. She spent the next 30 years writing, giving speeches, and supporting strikes. Goldman was arrested many times, and in 1919, in the midst of a Red Scare that targeted anyone associated with radicalism, she was arrested and deported to Russia. Emma Goldman once said, No real social change has ever been brought about without a revolution. June 27, 1880, Helen Keller was born in Tuscumbria, Alabama. Helen Keller became internationally famous in the early 20th century as a woman who, despite being blind and deaf, had learned to read and write. Her inspirational story, chronicled in her autobiography and in stage and film adaptations, was one of triumph over adversity. But many people forget that Helen Keller was also an outspoken political activist, who championed the rights of women and workers. June 29, 1941, Stokely Carmichael was born on the Caribbean island of Trinidad. Carmichael became deeply involved in the civil rights movement, but he eventually grew frustrated with the slow pace of change and the cautious attitude among leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. Gradually, Carmichael found inspiration in the radical message of Malcolm X, leading him to develop his own radical message of black power. Targeted by the FBI, he fled the U.S. in 1968 and settled in Africa, where he continued his involvement in the global struggle for black freedom. He never returned to the United States and died in the country of Guinea in 1998. Stokely Carmichael once said, In order to understand white supremacy, we must dismiss the fallacious notion that white people can give anybody their freedom. Okay, what about events? June 25th, 1876, General George Armstrong Custer and nearly every member of the United States Army's 7th Cavalry are killed at the Battle of Little Bighorn in South Dakota. Custer and his force were part of a sweeping effort in 1876 to force tribes in the Upper Great Plains onto reservations. Always seeking to win headlines and secretly harboring visions of high office, Custer attacked what he thought was a small Indian encampment. But he encountered a massive force of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors who killed Custer and 267 of his men. It's considered one of the greatest military defeats in U.S. history. June 28, 1969, 50 years ago this week, Patrons at the Stonewall Inn in New York's Greenwich Village, a well-known bar that catered to LGBTQ patrons, 
rioted against the New York City Police Department. In those days, the police routinely raided gay bars to harass the clientele and extort money from them and the owners. But on this occasion, the patrons fought back, triggering four nights of rioting and emboldening many LGBTQ New Yorkers to demand equal treatment. The following year, they staged the nation's first gay pride parade. A movement had been born. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to Dick Leach, the executive director of a pioneering gay rights organization called the Mattachine Society. Not long after the riots, he explained why Stonewall was different from other gay bars and why it was the place where patrons fought back 50 years ago this week. He wrote, This club was more than a dance bar, more than just a gay gathering place. It catered largely to a group of people who are not welcome in or cannot afford other places of homosexual gathering. The drags and the queens, two groups which would find a chilly reception or a barred door at most other gay bars and clubs, formed the regulars at Stonewall. Another group was even more dependent on the Stonewall, the very young homosexuals and those with no other homes. Most of them are between 16 and 25 and came here from other places without jobs, money, or contacts. Many of them are running away from unhappy homes. They came to New York with the clothes on their back. They live in the streets, panhandling or shoplifting for the price of admission to the Stonewall. That was the one advantage to the place. For $3 admission, one could stay inside, out of the winter's cold or the summer heat, all night long. The Stonewall became home to these kids. When it was raided, they fought for it. That and the fact that they had nothing to lose, other than the most tolerant and broad-minded gay place in town, explains why the Stonewall riots were begun, led, and spearheaded by Queens. Okay, people, that's your history fix for the week. Now put it in drive and go make your own history. <laughs>